I know why the Spanish invented this siesta. The after, siesta. After such a high energetic uh, presentation, I know that you need some rest. So um, feel free to be as energetic again this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Professor Kutz for his uh, introduction. Uh, of course, I was able to uh, have a quick lunch and sleep a little bit of siesta afterwards. Although I am very early comparing with my normal schedule because uh, we normally have lunch at home at 3.30 p.m. And I sleep my siesta put into my pyjamas, which are very important, every day from 4 to 5.30 p.m. Eh? And then I go to the university. <laughs> uh? Okay, well, uh, what I plan to do today is to elaborate with more detail in uh, the, the subject matter I mentioned this morning regarding the capital theory and Austrian business cycle theory. And even to apply the Austrian approach to the uh, most recent Great Recession. We are still suffering uh, all around the world and especially in Spain and other countries of Europe. And I would like to start by stressing uh, an important idea, because in my opinion, all the financial and economic problems we are suffering today are the result, in one way or another, of something that happened in England on July 19, 1844. So what happened in that fateful day that has conditioned uh, uh, the whole financial and economic evolution of the world up to today? Well, on that date, Peel's Bank Act was enacted after uh, many years of debate between the banking and the currency school theorists on the true causes of the artificial economic booms and the subsequent financial crisis that uh, were affecting the United Kingdom, especially since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. The, the, bank, and, the bank Charter Act, Peel's Bank Act of 1844, successfully incorporated the sound monetary theoretical insights of the currency school. Because this school, currency school, was able to correctly di diagnose that the origin of the boom and bust cycles that were affecting England uh, lay in the artificial trade expansions that were orchestrated by private banks and financed not by the prior and genuine savings of citizens, but through the issue of huge doses of fiduciary media in those days mainly paper banknotes or certificates of demand deposits that were issued by banks for a much greater amount than the gold originally deposited in their vaults. So the requirement by Peel's Bank Act of a 100% reserve on the banknotes issued was not only in full accordance with the most elementary principles of Roman law regarding the need to prevent the forgery or if you want, the over-issue of deposit certificates, but also was a first and a very positive, positive step in the right direction to avoid endlessly recurring cycles of boon and depressions. However, Peel's Bank Act, and notwithstanding the good intentions behind it and its sound theoretical foundations, was a huge failure. And why? Why it was a huge failure? because this legislation stopped short of extending the 100% requirement to demand deposits also. Unfortunately, by Peel's day, some ideas originally developed by the Spanish scholastics of the Spanish golden century, we were commenting this morning, uh, were entirely forgotten. The scholastics had discovered 300 years earlier that demand deposits which they called in Latin uh, chirographis pecuniarum, or money, money created only by the entries in banks' accounting books. Eh? Chirographis pecuniarum in Latin, in English we could translate it as written money. Eh? Uh, they, they discovered 300 years earlier than Peel's uh, legislation that uh, this written money uh, was part of the monetary supply, exactly the same as gold coins. And, and these scholars, the Spanish scholastics, also realized that from a legal point of view, neglecting to maintain a 100% reserve on demand deposits is a mortal sin. Mortal sin is the way they describe it. Or, or a crime. A crime, of course, not of forgery, as in the case with the over-issue of bank notes, 
but of misappropriation. So this, this error of Peel's Bank Act, uh, and or we could say of most economists of that period, uh, uh, who were ignorant of something already discovered much earlier by our scholastics, proved to be a fatal error. Because after 1844, bankers did continue to keep fractional reserves, of, of course, not on banknotes, uh, but on uh, demand deposits. What they did is to redirect their business from the traditional business of issuing banknotes to uh, the same business from the economic point of view of issuing demand deposits without a 100% reserve. So what happened is that artificial credit expansions and economic booms did continue and financial crises and economic recessions were not avoided. And despite all the hopes and good intentions originally put into Peel's Bank Act, this piece, this nice piece of legislation soon lost all of its credibility and popular uh, support. Not only that, but the failure of the Bank Act conditioned, has conditioned the evolution of financial matters up to the present time and fully explains the wrong institutional design that afflicts the financial and monetary system of the so-called free market economics, and also the dreadful economic consequences we are still suffering. And this is something incredible, that uh, well into the 21st century, we are still suffering the consequences of this error, original uh, error in Bill's Bank Act. So when we consider this failure of the Bank Charter Act, the evolution of events up to now makes perfect sense. Bubbles did continue to form. As I said, financial crisis and economic recessions were not avoided. Bank bailouts were regularly demanded. And the lender of last resort or central bank was created precisely to bail out banks and to permit the creation of the necessary liquidity in the moments of crisis. Gold eventually was abandoned and legal tender laws and a purely fiduciary system was introduced all over the world. So as we can see, the outcome of this historical process gives us a clear light on the wrong institutional design and the financial mess that, as I said, incredibly is still affecting all of us today. Now, uh, it is important that uh, we review, bef before we, ho we go ahead, which is the healthy process of capital accumulation based on uh, true uh, savings. What uh, I plan to do now is to quickly review the specifics of the economic process through which artificial credit expansions created by a fractional reserve banking system under the direction of a central bank entirely distort the real productive structure and thus generate bubbles, induce unwise investments, and finally uh, trigger a financial crisis in a deep economic recession. But before that, we must uh, remember the fundamental rudiments of Austrian capital theory, which up to the present time, and at least since the Keynesian revolution, have been almost entirely absent from the syllabus of most university courses on economic theory. In other words, uh, I'm going first Go, going to explain the specific entrepreneurial, spontaneous, and microeconomic processes that in an unhampered free market tend to correctly invest all funds previously saved by economic agents. And this is important because only this knowledge will permit us in a moment to understand the huge differences with respect to what really happens if investment is financed not by true savings, but by the mere creation out of thin air of new demand deposits, which only materialize in the entries of banks' accounting books. So what I'm going to do now is to explain uh, nothing more and nothing less than why the so-called paradox of saving is entirely wrong from the standpoint the standpoint uh, or the, from the point of view of Austrian uh, economics. And as I said, this is, is unfortu most unfortunate that uh, very few students on economic theory know even when they finish their studies in the university and leave the university these uh, rudiments of, of capital uh, theory. And we must take into account that Hayek said that the best test, the best test indeed of a good economist applies without any doubt 
to one of the most important spontaneous market processes. And it consists of knowing precisely about this process through which uh, genuine savings at the end are correctly invested. So in order to understand what will follow, and I'm, I'm now following the, the same uh, logic Hayek follows in his book, Prices and Production, uh, we must visualize first the real productive structure of the market as a temporal flow of our process composed of many very complex temporal stages in which most labor, capital goods, and, and productive resources are not devoted to producing consumer goods maturing this year, but they are uh, producing consumer goods that eventually will mature uh, and will be demanded by consumers two years from now, three years from now, four years, and even many more years from now. For instance, a very long period of time, uh, a very long period of years elapses between the time engineers begin to imagine and design a new, I would say, uh, hybrid BMW car, and the time the iron ore has already been mined and converted into steel, the different parts of the car have been produced and assembled in the auto factory, the new cars are distributed, marketed, and finally uh, sold. And this period, period of time uh, includes a very complex set of successive temporal productive uh, stages. So what happens? if the subjective time preference of economic agents suddenly decreases, and as a result, the current consumption of this year decreases, for example, by 10%. Eh? If this increase, a sudden increase in saving, uh, savings happens, three key spontaneous microeconomic processes are triggered and tend to guarantee the correct investment of the newly saved uh, consumer goods. Let us review these three effects quickly. The first effect is the new dis disparity in profits, in profit margins between the different productive stages. Of course, immediate sales in current consumer goods industries will fall and profits will decrease and stagnate compared with the profits in other sectors farther away in time from current uh, consumption. Eh? I'm referring to industries which produce consumer goods maturing two, three, five, or more years from now, their profitability not being affected by the negative evolution of short-term current consumption. And as you know, entrepreneurial profits are the key signal that moves entrepreneurs in their investment decisions. And the relatively superior profit behavior of capital goods industries, uh, comparing with the poor uh, behavior of uh, co more closer to consumption uh, industries, shows entrepreneurs that they must redirect their investments from the short-term consumption to more long-term uh, uh, industries further from uh, immediate uh, consumption. So the, the first effect refers to this uh, signal. And it is important because Keynesians do not realize about that. They are only thinking in two stages, consumption and investment. And they do not realize that most of the uh, productive investment in our societies is uh, directed to the production of consumer goods that will mature in a very distant future. And, and, and this, those industries are not affected uh, by the behavior of short-term consumption. This is a very important uh, idea. Let us go to the second effect that this uh, sudden increase in savings uh, produces. Uh, is a, the, the second effect refers to the decrease in the interest rate and the way it influences the market price of capital goods situated further away in time from consumption. You know the interest rate is used to discount the present value of the expected future returns of each capital good. And a decrease in the interest rate increases the market price of capital goods. And this increase in price is greater the longer the capital good takes to reach maturity as a consumer good. So this significant increase in the market prices of capital goods compared with the relatively lower prices of the less demanded consumer goods due to this increase in savings is a second very powerful microeconomic effect that also signals all around the market that entrepreneurs must redirect their effort and investment less 
toward immediate consumer gas goods industries and more in capital goods industries farther away from consumption. And let's go to the third and last effect that is what Hayat called the Ricardo, the Ricardo effect, which refers to the impact on real wages of any increase in savings. So let us review the argument. Whenever savings increase, sales and market prices of immediate consumer goods relatively stagnate or even decrease. This is obvious. This has decreased the demand for consumer goods. This is the meaning of an increase in savings. And if factor incomes remain more or less the same, this means higher real wages and the corresponding reaction of entrepreneurs, what would be? To try in the margin to substitute the now relatively cheaper capital goods for labor. This is the meaning of the Ricardo effect that explains that it is perfectly possible to earn profits even when sales of consumer goods or consumer goods turn over, go down if costs decrease even more through the replacement of labor, which has become more expensive with machines, computers, for instance. Now the question is, who is going to produce these machines, computers and capital goods that are newly demanded in order to, in the margin, substitute labor? Precisely the workers who have been dismissed by the stagnating consumer goods industries and who have relocated to the more distant capital goods industries where there is a new demand for them to produce the newly demanded capital goods. So this third effect, the Ricardo effect, I think we should call it in fact the Hayek effect, along with the other two mentioned above, promotes at the end a longer productive process with more stages which are farther away from current consumption. And this, this new, more capital-intensive productive structure is, is fully sustainable since it is fully baked by prior genuine real savings. Furthermore, it can also significantly increase in the future the final production of consumer goods and the real income of all economic agents. So these three combined effects all work in the same direction. And they are the most elementary teachings of capital theory. And they explain the secular tendency of the unhampered market to correctly invest new savings and constantly promote capital accumulation and the corresponding sustainable increase in economic welfare and development. So let's, let's go now a step further and study the unsustainable nature of the bubbles induced by artificial credit expansions created by the fractional reserve banking industry. Now it's going to be relatively easy because we can compare or contrast uh, the two processes and why they are entirely different. So uh, what happens if investments are financed no by a prior genuine increase in savings but by a process of artificial credit expansion orchestrated by fractional reserve banks and directed by the lender of last resort, by the central bank. Well, unilateral credit expansions means that new loans are provided by banks and recorded in the asset side of their balance sheets against new demand deposits that are created out of thin air as a collateral for the new loans and are automatically recorded on the liability side of banks' balance sheets. So new money, or if you prefer, we could uh, refer to it as new virtual money, because it only materializes in bank accounting book in entries, is constantly created through this process of artificial credit expansion. And in fact, we could say that roughly only around uh, only around 10% of the money supply of the most important economies nowadays is in the form of cash, paper bills and, and coins, while the remaining 90% of the money supply is this kind of virtual money that only exists as written entries in banks' accounting books. And this is precisely what the Spanish scholastics term over 400 years ago, chirographis pecuniarum, or virtual money that only exists in writing in an accounting book. 
So it is, it is easy to understand why great expansions are so tempting and popular, and the way in which they entirely corrupt the behavior of economic agents and deeply demoralize society at all levels. To begin with, entrepreneurs are usually very happy with expansions of credit because they make it seem as if any investment project, no matter how crazy it would appear in other situations, could easily get financing at very low interest rates. The money created through great expansions is used by entrepreneurs to demand factors of production, which they uh, employ mainly in capital goods industries more distant from consumption. As the process has not been triggered by an increase in savings, no productive resources have been liberated from consumer goods industries. And the prices of commodities, factors of production, capital goods, and the securities that represent them in the stock market tend to grow substantially and create a market bubble. And everybody is happy in a market bubble especially because it appears it would be possible to increase one's wealth very easily without any sacrifice in the form of a prior saving or, or a honest, hard individual work. So the so-called virtuous circle of the new economy in which recessions seem to have been avoided forever cheats all economic agents. Investors are very happy looking at, at the stock market quotations that grow day after day. Consumer goods industries are able to sell everything they carry to the market at ever-increasing prices. Restaurants, for, for instance, are always full with long waiting lists just to get a table. Or workers, workers and their unions, see how desperately entrepreneurs demand their services in an environment of full employment, wage increases, and immigration. And political leaders, what about political leaders? They benefit a lot from what appears to be an exceptionally good economic and social climate that they invariably sell to the electorate as the direct result of their leadership and good economic policies. And what about the state budget? The state budget bu bureaucrats, they are astonished to find that every year public income increases, even at double digit figures, particularly the proceeds from value added ta tax which through in, though in the end is paid by, as you know, the final consumer, it is advanced by the entrepreneurs of the early stages, newly created by, and artificially financed by credit expansion. So everybody is happy in a bubble. But we now can ask ourselves, how long can this party last? How long can there continue to be a huge discoordination between the behavior of consumers who do not wish to increase their saving and that of investors who continually increase their investment financed by banks' artificial creation of virtual money and not by citizens' prior genuine savings? How long can this illusion that everybody can get whatever he wants without any sacrifice last? The unhampered market is a very dynamically efficient process. Sooner or later, it inevitably discovers and tries to correct the huge errors committed. And six, now six, spontaneous, again, micro, not macro, micro reactions always developed. And they halt and tend to revert the negative effects of the bubble years financed by artificial credit expansion. So, in my book on money, bank trade and economic cycles, I referred this morning, I study with full detail these six spontaneous and inevitable microeconomic causes of the reversal of the artificial boom. Let us, let us summarize these six fac uh, factors, but very briefly. Eh? So, the first effect that tends to put an end to the bubble and to revert it is the rise in the price of the original means of production mainly labor, natural resources, and commodities. And, and this rise appears when these resources uh, have not been liberated from consumer goods industries. Remember that we are now assuming that savings have not increased previously. And the entrepreneurs of the different stages in the production process compete with each other, demanding the original means of production with, with what? With the newly created loans they have received from the banking system. 
But there is a second effect. is the subsequent rise in the price of consumer goods and even uh, at an even quicker pass, at even quicker speed than that of the rise in the price of the factors of production. And this happens when the time preference remains stable and the new money created by banks reaches the pockets of the consumers in an environment in which entrepreneurs are, are frantically trying to produce more for distant consumption and less for immediate consumption of all kinds of goods. And this also explains the second effect, the, the, the subsequent rise at a greater speed in the price of factors of production. This explains the, the third effect, which is the, the substantially relative increase in the accounting profits of companies closest to final consumption, especially comparing with the profits of capital goods industries, which begin to stagnate when their costs rise more rapidly than their turnover. So we are now looking at a picture which is exactly the opposite of the picture we were describing at the beginning, where we were describing the process of a healthy capital accumulation of true savings. And there is a fourth effect, which is the Ricardo effect, that also now is acting in exactly the opposite way I mentioned before. Because uh, this, uh, it is very easy to understand. Now the, relatively, the relative rise in the prices of consumer goods and of, or if, you, if you do not see an increase in the prices of consumer goods, you could uh, empirically see an increase in the turnover eh, uh, of consumer goods uh, industries or companies in an environment of an increased productivity. So this increase with respect to the increase in original factor income begins to drive down real wages, motivating entrepreneurs to substitute cheaper labor for machinery, which even lessens more the demand for capital goods and further reduces the profits of companies operating now in the stages farthest from consumption. And there is a fifth effect, which is the increase in the loan rate of interest, even exceeding the pre-credit expansion levels. And this happens when the, when the pace of credit expansion stops accelerating, something that always, sooner or later, occurs. Interest rates significantly increase due to the higher purchasing power and risk premiums demanded, de demanded by the lenders. And furthermore, entrepreneurs involved in, in malinvestment start a fight to death to obtain additional financing to try to complete their investment projects. Mm -hmm. this, is, uh, this is a famous article of Hayek in uh, uh, Profits, Interest, and Investment, entitled uh, Investment that Increases the Demand for Capital, that explains this, this process of competition among, among entrepreneurs trying frantically to finish the unsustainable investment projects. And these five factors provoke, at the end, the following sixth combined effect, is that finally companies which operate in the stages relatively more distant from consumption begin to discover they are incurring in heavy accounting losses. And these accounting losses, when compared with the relatively profit gen profits generated in the stages closest to consumption, finally reveal beyond any doubt that serious entrepreneurial errors have been committed and that there is an urgent need to correct them, first by paralyzing and liquidating the investment projects mistakenly launched during the boom years, and then trying to restructure the whole economy in the right uh, uh, direction. The financial crisis begins the moment the market, which as I have said is very dynamically efficient, discovers that the true market value of the loans granted by banks during the boom is only a fraction of what was originally thought. In other words, the market discovers that the value of bank assets is much lower than previously thought. And as bank liabilities, which are the deposits created during the bu bubble, remain constant, the market discovers all of a sudden that, in fact, most banks are bankrupt. And were it not for the desperate action of the lender of last resort in bailing out the banks, the whole financial and monetary system would collapse. In any case, it is important to understand that the financial and banking crisis is not the cause eh, of the economic recession, but one of its most important first symptoms. E economic recessions begin when the market discovers that many investment projects 
launched during the boom years are not profitable. And then consumers demand liquidation of these malinvestments, which it is now discovered were planned to mature in a too distant future, considering the true wishes of consumers regarding consumption and saving. And the recession marks the beginning of the painful readjustment of the productive structure, which consists of withdrawing productive resources from the stages farthest from consumption and transferring them back to those closest uh, to it. For instance, in Spain, we build one million new homes, most of them near the seashore. And nobody wanted those homes. We, we, only in Spain, we were building around 700,000 new homes per year, more than in the, in the rest of the whole European Union together. Eh? During the bubble years, everybody thought that those were sustainable investments, but we finally found that it was a crazy eh, project all, all together. Both the financial crisis and the economic recession are always unavoidable once credit expansion has begun. Because the market sooner or later discovers that investment projects financed by banks during the boom period were too ambitious due to a lack of the real saved resources that would be needed to complete these projects. In other words, bank credit expansion during the boom period encourages entrepreneurs to act as if savings had increased when, in fact, this is not the case. A generalized error of economic calculation has been committed, and sooner or later it will be discovered and corrected spontaneously by the market. And in fact, all the Hayekian theory of economic cycles is only a particular case of the theory of the impossibility of economic calculation under socialism discovered by Ludwig von Mises, which is also fully applicable to the current broadly designed and heavily regulated banking uh, system. So let us make a few comments regarding the last uh, great uh, recession. Because the expansionary cycle, which came to a close with the, this great recession since uh, 2008, was set in motion when the American economy emerged from its previous recession of, in 2001, and the Federal Reserve embarked again on a major artificial expansion of credit and investment, an expansion that was not backed again by a parallel increase in voluntary households saving. In fact, as you know, for several years, the money supply in the form of banknotes and deposits grew at an average rate of over 10% per year, eh? which means that every seven years, the total volume of money circulating in the world could have been doubled. The media of exchange originating from this severe fiduciary inflation was placed on the market by the banking system as newly created loans granted at extremely low and even negative in real terms interest rates. And this uh, created a speculative bubble in the shape of a substantial rise in the prices of capital goods, real estate assets, and the securities which represent them in our exchange uh, on the stock market, where, as you know, the indexes soared. So curious, curiously enough, like in the roaring years prior to the Great Depression of 1929, the shock of monetary growth did not significantly influence the unit prices of the such set of consumer goods and services, which are approximately only around one third of the total number of goods that are exchanged in the market, being the other two thirds mainly capital goods. The last two decades, like in the 1920s, has seen a remarkable, as you know, increase in productivity as a result of the introduction on a massive scale of new technologies, uh, of significant entrepreneurial innovations, where it not for the money and credit injection would, would have given rise to a healthy and sustained reduction in the unit price of the goods and services all citizens consume, would have produced a healthy deflation, I was commenting this morning. And we should also consider the, full, the, the effect of the full incorporation of the economies of China and India in the globalized market eh, during the last 20 years that has gradually raised the real productivity of consumer goods and services even further. We could say that China is the factory of the world eh, nowadays. So the absence of a healthy deflation in the prices of consumer goods in a stage of such considerable growth in productivity 
provides the main evidence that the monetary shock seriously disturbed the whole economic process. And, and let us remember the anti-deflationist paranoia of those who, even during the years of the bubble, used the slightest symptoms of this healthy deflation to justify even greater doses of credit expansion. As we have already seen, artificial credit expansion and the fiduciary inflation of media of exchange offer no shortcut to a stable and sustainable economic development. No way of avoiding the necessary sacrifice and discipline behind all high rates of voluntary uh, saving. In fact, before the crisis, in particular in the United States, voluntary saving, as you know, not only failed to increase, but even fell to a negative rate in some of the years prior to the crisis. So the, the specific factors that trigger the end of the euphoric monetary binge and the beginning of the recessionary hangover are many, and they can vary from one cycle to another. As you know, in this past crisis, the most obvious triggers were first the rise in the price of commodities and raw materials, particularly oil. Second, the subprime mortgage, uh, mortgage crisis in the United States. And finally, the failure of important banking institutions when it became clear that the, in the market that the value of their debts exceeded that of their assets, eh? mainly mortgage uh, loans erroneously granted. If we consider the level of past credit expansion and the quality and volume of malinvestment produced by it, we could say that very probably in this past cycle, the economies of the European Monetary Union are in comparison in a somewhat less poor state. If we do not consider now the relatively greater, of course, continental European rigidities, particularly in the labor market, which tend to make recessions in Europe longer and more painful. Mm -hmm. The expansionary policy of the European Central Bank, though not free of grave errors, have been somewhat less irresponsible than that of the American Federal Reserve. Furthermore, as you remember, the, the fulfillment of the convergence criteria for the monetary union involved at the time a relatively healthy and significant rehabilitation of the chief European economies. And some, only some countries on the periphery, like Ireland, Portugal, Greece, and my own country, Spain, were immersed in considerable credit expansion from the time they initiated their processes of conver convergence. And the case of Spain is paradigmatic. The Spanish economy underwent an economic boom, which in part, of course, was due to real causes, like the liberalizing structural reforms which were initially originated by the government of Jose Maria Aznar uh, 15 years ago. But nevertheless, this boom was also largely fueled by an artificial expansion of money and credit, which grew at a rate nearly three times the corresponding rates in France and Germany. And why? Because Spanish economic agents essentially interpreted the decrease in interest rates which resulted from the convergence process in the easy money terms that were traditional in Spain. A greater availability of easy money and a mass request for loans for, uh, from Spanish banks, mainly to finance, as you know, real estate speculation. Loans which Spanish banks granted by create, creating the money ex nihilo, while the European Central Bankers look on unperturbed, without any problems. And once the crisis hit, uh, the readjustment in Spain has been very quick and efficient. In less than a year, more than 150,000 companies, mainly related with the building sector, disappeared. Almost 3 million workers who were employed in their own sectors, related with, again, real estate, were dismissed. And significant reforms were enacted based on austerity and liberalization. And nowadays we can conclude, and we, I will give more details tomorrow, that although still very weak, the, economy, the economic body of Spain has been already healed. Eh? In fact, the Spanish uh, gross national product is already growing between 1% and 2%. Unemployment is, is falling around 10% per year. I mean, from the 26% of unemployment we got uh, last year, now it is around 23%. And everything this is being experienced 
experience in a very healthy deflation environment of around half a percentage uh, point. Now we could ask ourselves in a, in a moment, who, who has been responsible for this great recession? I think this is a, an important question. Of course, the, the, the spontaneous order of the unhampered market was not responsible for the great recession. One of the most typical consequences of every past crisis, and of course of this current one, and will happen again in the future, is how, how many people are blaming the market and firmly believing that the recession is a, fa a market failure that requires more government intervention. You know that the market is a process that spontaneously reacts in the way we have seen against the monetary aggression of the bubble years, which consisted of a huge credit expansion that was not only allowed, but even orchestrated and directed by central banks, which are the institutions truly responsible for all the economic sufferings from the crisis and recession that are affecting, still is affecting the world. Um, Paradoxically, central bankers have been able to present themselves to the general public not only as indignant victims of the list of ad hoc scapegoats they have been able to put together. Let us review. Stupid private bankers, greedy managers receiving exorbitant bonuses, and so on and so, so forth. But also they present our, uh, themselves as the only institutions which by bailing out the banking system as a last resort have avoided a much greater uh, tragedy. In any case, I think it is crystal clear that the world monetary and banking system has chronically suffered from a wrong institutional design, as I said, at least since Peel's Bank Act of 1844. There is no free market in the monetary and banking system, but just the opposite. Private money has been nationalized. Legal tender rules introduced. A huge mess of administrative regulations have been enacted. The interest rate is constantly manipulated. And most importantly, everything is directed by a monetary central planning agency, the central bank. In other words, real socialism represented by state money, central banks, and financial administrative regulations is still in force in the monetary and credit sectors of the so-called free market economies. As a result of this fact, we experience regularly in the area of money and credit all the negative consequences that were established by the theorem of the impossibility of socialism discovered by those distinguished members of the Austrian School of Economics, Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich Hayek. Specifically, the central planners of state money are not able to know, to follow, and to control the changes in both the demand for and the supply of money. Furthermore, as we have seen, the whole financial system is based on the legal privilege given by the state to private bankers who can use a fractional reserve ratio with respect to the demand deposits they receive from their customers. As a result of this privilege, private bankers are not true financial intermediaries, but are mainly creators of deposits, materializing in credit expansions that inevitably end in crisis and recession. The most rigorous economic analysis and the coolest, most balanced interpretation of past and recent economic and financial events lead inexorably to the conclusion that central banks, which again are true financial central planning agencies, cannot possibly succeed in finding the most convenient monetary policy at every moment. This is exactly the kind of problem that became evident in the case of the failed attem attempts to plan the former Soviet economy uh, from uh, above. So indeed, nothing is more dangerous than to indulge in the fatal conceit to use Hayek's useful expression, the title of his last book, of believing oneself omniscient, or at least wise and powerful enough to be able to keep the most, the most suitable monetary policy fine-tuned at all times. And we can understand now why, rather than softening the most violent ups and downs of the economic cycle, the Federal Reserve and also, of course, the European Central Bank have been the main architects of the, and the culprits in their worsening. So I would like now to refer 
to which are the possible scenarios eh, the, and, uh, that, that could be imagined uh, after a bubble and a financial crisis scenarization uh, has have been developed. And which is the most appropriate economic policy that we could uh, or we should uh, follow. So th theoretically, under the wrongly designed current financial system, once a crisis hit, we can think of at least four possible scenarios. The first scenario is the catastrophic one in which the whole banking system, based on fractional reserve, collapses. This scenario seems to have been avoided by central banks, which act in as lenders of last resort bail out private banks whenever it was necessary. The second scenario is just the opposite of the first one, but equally tragic. It consists of an inflationist cure so intense that a new bubble is created. Eh? This forward escape would only temporarily postpone the solution of the problems at the cost of making them far more serious later. I think th that this is precisely what happened in the crisis of 2001. The third scenario is what I have called the Japanization of the economy. It happens when the reintroduction of the cheap credit policy, together with all conceivable government interventions, entirely blocks the spontaneous market process of liquidation of unprofitable investments and company reconversion. As a result, the recession is prolonged indefinitely and the economy does not recover and ceases to respond to any stimulus involving even either monetary credit expansions or if you want Keynesian methods. And finally, the fourth and final scenario. This happens when the spontaneous order of the market against all odds and despite all government interventions is finally able to complete the micro economic readjustment of the whole economy and the necessary reallocation of labor and the other factors of production toward profitable lines based on sustainable new investment uh, projects. In any case, after a financial crisis and an economic recession have hit, it is necessary to avoid any additional credit expansion. Apart, this is the only thing I would accept, apart from the minimum monetary injection is strictly necessary to avoid the collapse of the whole fractional reserve banking system. And the most appropriate policy is to liberalize the economy at all levels, especially in the labor market, to permit the rapid reallocation of productive factors to profitable sectors. Likewise, it is essential to reduce public spending and taxes in order to increase the available income of heavily indebted economic agents who need to repay their loans as soon as possible. Economic agents in general and corporations in particular can only rehabilitate their finances by cutting costs, especially labor costs, and paying off loans. And essential to this aim are a very flexible labor market and a much more austere public sector. These measures are fundamental if the market is to rebuild as quickly as possible the real value of the investment goods produced in error and thus lay the foundation for a healthy, sustainable economic recovery. As Spain now is, as I told you, beginning to uh, experience. And now, to conclude, I began this lecture with Peel's Bank Act, and I will also finish with it. On June 13, and also on June the 24th of 1844, Robert Peel at the British Parliament pointed out that in each one of the previous monetary crises, I now will quote literally, there was an increase in the issues of country bank paper. And that currency without basis, this is the expression used by Robert Peel, only creates fictitious value. Hmm. It's, what a kind of politician, how, how sound was his economic wisdom. And he adds, and when the bubble bursts, it spreads ruin over the country and deranges all commercial transactions. It's a huge mess in the real economy. Today, 170 years later, we are still suffering from the problems that were already correctly diagnosed by Robert Peel. 
And in order to solve them and finally reach the only truly free and stable financial and monetary system that is compatible with a free market economy in this 21st century, it will be necessary to take the following three steps. Let us review them. First, to develop and culminate the basic concept of Peel's Bank Act by also extending the prescription of 100% uh, reserve requirement to demand deposits and its equivalents. Hayek states that this radical solution would prevent all future crises, as no credit expansions would be possible without a prior increase in real genuine savings making investments sustainable and fully matched with prior voluntary savings. And I would add to Hayek's statement the most important fact that 100% banking is the only system compatible with the general principles of the law of property rights that are indispensable for the capitalist system to work. There is no reason to treat the deposits of money differently from any other deposit of a fungible good, such as wheat or oil, in which nobody doubts the need to keep the 100% reserve requirement, in the case of a demand deposit again. And in relation to this first step of the proposed reform, it is most encouraging to see how, for instance, a few years ago, two Tory members of the parliament, Douglas Carswell and Steve Baker, well, Douglas Carswell just left the Tory party, and he changed to the United Kingdom Independence Party a few weeks uh, ago. But in those uh, three years ago, these two gentlemen were still members, at least uh, Douglas Carswell uh, of the Tory party. And they were able to introduce in the British Parliament on September the 15th, 2010, the first reading of a bill to reform the banking system extending the prescriptions of Peel's Bank Act to demand deposits. By the way, Peel's Bank Act is still in force in the United Kingdom. And this tells you a lot about uh, the tradition, the value that the British people gives to their traditions. They, they named this uh, piece of project uh, of, of legislation as Customer Choice Disclosure and Protection Bill, and had two goals. First of all, to fully and effectively defend citizens the citizens' right of ownership over their money they have deposited in checking accounts at banks. And second, to once and for all put an end to the recurrent cycles of artificial boom, financial crisis, and economic recession. Of course, this first draft of the bill needed to be completed with many additional details. For instance, the time period, let us say a month, under which all deposits should be considered demand deposits. And they need to clarify that any contract that guarantees full availability of its nominal value at any moment should be considered at all effects as a demand deposit for a storage, as they name it in the project. But although this project was not completed successfully, you know, the, the chancellor of the Exchequer, Osborne, just name a commission. Whenever you want to destroy something, you just name a commission to reform the British banking system. And at the end, well, with, uh, the, the conclusion of the commission was to reintroduce the Glass-Steagall Act, separating uh, the, the, the short-term operation of banking, uh, commercial banking, from investment, investment banking, which I think is a uh, very, very timid step in the right direction, but is not attacking the true causes of, of, of the problem. Hmm? But anyhow, the, the mere discussion of these matters in the British Parliament, in the House of Commons, and by the public at large, uh, has been in itself of huge importance. And, and I should mention now also that a similar project, but adapted to the European Central Bank, has been developed for, for Europe by the German economist Thomas Mayer that has published very, very recently a book uh, describing uh, it. And so I'm very happy to see also this uh, uh, movement uh, here in, in the Eurozone. So this, uh, is, those are my comments regarding the first step of the reform. Let's go to the second step. The second step is that if, if we wish to culminate the fall of the Berlin Wall, and get rid of the, of the real socialism that still remains in the monetary and credit sector, a priority would be the elimination of central banks. So I will tell that also tomorrow to the central, my colleagues that have been working for the central bank. 
And why? Because central banks, which would be rendered completely unnecessary as lenders of last resort, of course, if the above 100% reserve reform is introduced. And of course, they are harmful if they insist on continuing to act as financial central planning agencies. And this is one of the things I do in my book on money bank credit and economic cycles in chapter eight, to apply the theory of the, on the impossibility of eco, uh, the economic calculation under socialism to the current financial system and to the uh, working of uh, central banks. And finally, third, the question would be, who will issue, who will issue the monetary base? Hmm? Uh, French winner of the Nobel Prize in economics Maurice Allais, who passed away a few years ago, proposed that a public agency should be created to print the public paper money at a rate of increase of 2% per year. Why 2% per year? Because, well, he said, well, it's, it's quite conservative and it's very similar to the secular increase in the stock of gold. Eh? Well, I personally do not trust this solution. Uh, as any emergency situation in the state budget could be used, as, as in the past, as a pretext for issuing additional doses of fiduciary media. For this reason, and this is probably my most controversial proposal, in order to put an end to any future manipulation of our money by the authorities, what is required is full privatization of the current monopolistic and fiduciary state issue paper-based money, and is replacement with a classic pure gold standard. And why pure gold standard? Because we go to the history, we can check empirically that the money secularly chosen by humanity has been gold. Of course, we cannot be sure about which money could prevail in a truly free financial and monetary system. This is something that must be uh, created anew by entrepreneurs in a process of evolution. But let us privatize money with the last money we knew that was chosen by the humanity, gold, and let us see how the evolution continues. This is my, my prescription. There is an, an old Spanish saying, a grandes males, grandes remedios, eh? in English. Great problems require radical solutions. And though, of course, any step toward these three measures would be significantly, would significantly improve our current economic system, it must be understood that the reforms proposed and taken by governments up to now, and I include Basel II, Basel III, are only, in my opinion, never, never really attacking the symptoms, but not the real roots of the problem. And precisely for that reason, they will again miserably fail in the future. Meanwhile, it is very uh, most encouraging to see how a growing number of scholars and private institutions uh, are studying again not only the radical reforms required by a truly honest private money, but also very interesting proposal, proposals for a suitable transition to a new banking system, like the one I developed in chapter nine of my book on money, bank credit, and economic cycles. By the way, in this chapter, I also explain a most interesting byproduct of the proposed reform, namely the possibility it offers to pay off without any cost, nor inflationary effects, most of the existing public debt, which in the current circumstances is a very worrying and increasingly heavy burden in most countries. Briefly outline what I propose and several private centers have been studying and applying to different economies. For instance, the Cobden Center has developed my a proposal in more detail for the specific case of the United Kingdom. What I propose is, I would say, to print, of course it is not necessary to print, but you, it's a way to explain the, the, the proposal, to print the paper banknotes necessary to consolidate the volume of demand deposits that the public decides to keep in the banks. The issue of this new money, of course, would not be inflationary, as it would be handed to banks and kept entirely sterilized, so to speak, as 100% asset collateral of bank liabilities in the form of demand deposits. In this way, the, the basket of bank assets, loans, investments, and so on, that are currently backing the demand deposits would be freed. And what I, what I propose is to include this these free assets in mutual funds 
swapping the units at the market value for the outstanding treasury bonds. And I consider my proposal much better than the similar one developed afterwards by two international monetary fund economists, Michael Kunhoff and Jeromir Benz. And I would recommend to read uh, an article we have published in the last number of our journal, Procesos de Mercado, which is, uh, it, the author is Alok Basu from the London School of Economics, and the title is How to Create a Banking and Monetary System for the 21st Century, the Huerta de Soto and the Chicago Plans uh, Reworked. Um, and I think it's much better my, my, my uh, plan than the uh, Kunhoffs and Benz. What they propose is, is not to swap the units against the uh, standing public debt. They propose just to to, to condone, condone all debts to everybody. So it's like, a, uh, you know, give for free to all debtors uh, uh, the, 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 the corresponding loans that shouldn't, couldn't, would not be necessary to pay off anymore. In any case, an important warning must be given, is that naturally, and was never, must never uh, be tired of repeating it, the solution proposed is only valid in the context of an irrevocable decision to reestablish a free banking system subject to a 100% reserve requirement on demand deposits. Hmm? However, no matter how important this possibility is considered under the current circumstances, we must not forget that it is only a byproduct or a second of secondary importance compared to the major reform of the banking system we have outlined. What Kunhoff and Benz have done is to introduce the uh, Irving Fisher proposal for 100% in their, you know, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model in the International Monetary Fund. They have pushed the button and see the result of, in the computer. Oh, incredible. It's incredible. The, the gross national product worldwide will increase 10%. I think the, the methodology is completely wrong, and the, the growth in the, in the gross national product of the worldwide would be much greater than 10%, because they are only considering the, the savings of governments paying the corresponding cost of the current public debt, and they are not considering all the advantages of avoiding in the future the huge malinvestment created uh, in every cycle. But of course, they lack the necessary knowledge of capital, Austrian capital and business cycle theory to reach that uh, uh, conclusion. And now, and to finish, should in this 21st century a new Robert Peel, let us hope that is here in Germany, be able to successfully push for all these proposed reforms, he would again render uh, an invaluable service to the rest of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.